everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Outmarket.pro podcast. I'm your host, Mark Stein. Today, we've got Chris Madden joining us. He is with Jada Pay, uh, a credit card processing company. And we're here to talk about merchant services, credit card processing in general, and then funnel down and uh, talk about his particular business as well. Um, so uh, he's been in the credit card processing business for a long time. And it's my pleasure to welcome Chris to the podcast. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, looking forward to it. Awesome. So <clears throat> let's start out with your background. Um, and we've known each other personally uh, on the periphery for a long time, but uh, but for the last probably seven to 10 years uh, through a networking group. Um, so, uh, and I, I'm aware that you've done lots of different things. One in particular that I think is particularly colorful, and I don't think you're doing it now, is fireworks. Um, so, but you've done lots of different things, jack of all trades. Give me a, give me a one to two minute summary of some of the more colorful things that you've done. Oh my, um. You know, I was talking to somebody one time and they said, what haven't you done? Or I said, I probably should just tell you what I haven't done in my life. Because, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I started my very first business was in the fifth grade. I did uh, cinnamon flavored toothpicks. I would go to my grandmother's house once a week. I would make a batch of them. I'd pack them all up. And during the course of the week, I would sell those in my fifth grade class and everybody in grade school. That was my first business. And do you remember you know, what I you sold them for? Did you sell a bundle or did you sell them by the yeah. toothpick? Now they were there was 10 toothpicks in a little pack and I think I sold them for a dime and I mean back in, you know, way back then, that was 1960 something, uh, that was a lot of money. I mean, I always had money from doing that until my mother caught me cuz she was a school teacher and that was the end of it. So, <laughs> but that, that was the first, first business I actually ever had was in the fifth grade. So from there, I was always looking for things to do and I, I would try all kinds of different stuff. Sometimes it would be a, a job I'd have for a week, sometimes a month, sometimes in summer. I ran a, a seafood restaurant through my uh, junior, senior and first attempt at going to college and uh, then I went into the Air Force and was in there and I had some other jobs while I was uh, you know serving our country and then I got into the fundraising business and I had the company doing that and then I got into oh my gosh I ran some ran some retail stores sold real estate uh, the last venture that I had before getting into this was I had a party supply store so we sold Fireworks, party supplies, uh, Halloween costumes were huge. I loved Halloween. Um, and then because of things that just transpired and happened, I had to close it. Um, and that's how I got introduced to the credit card processing business. And that was, of course, has been my most successful venture that I've ever been involved in and still involved with it today. Uh, more semi-retired, as you can tell, I'm sitting under an umbrella on the beach. So there we go. Very good. Let, let me probe a couple things because I recognize myself in uh, in your description. Um, I, I was on the sales floor at seven in my father's clothing store and knew knew the merchandise as well as any of the old old timers. Um, did you sell seeds from grit newspaper or the back of the magazines, uh, seeds, records, uh, those sorts of su subscriptions? Did I, did I see those? No. Did you, did you sell seeds and stuff from the back of comic books and no. grit newspaper? No, <laughs> okay. no, no. 
Okay. And, you know, I probably would have, but reading was one of the things that I absolutely despise. I, I have a very difficult time reading, so I don't read comic books and I don't read magazines and newspapers. So I never really saw them because of that okay. reason. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, let's move. That's a very colorful past. And uh, like you said, what haven't you sold? Um but it, it sounds fun. And I had snow cone stands, uh, sold 45 records, uh, size records on the street. I always was selling stuff. So I, I really relate. Um, so, but let's, let's go ahead and move into credit card processing. Um, I think this is a pain point for a lot of people, um, maybe, and you know what, let's start there. Why is this difficult for people to either start with a credit card processor or switch credit card processors? Um, it seems like it's a pretty opaque business. Very few people really understand it. There's a lot of jargon around it. I feel like it's the it's one of the most common uh, processes, sales processes out there, but there's some pain around researching, comparing. Well, talk about the this challenge within the industry. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right because I mean I owned my own business and I had to deal with credit card processing companies, you know, on the on the ownership side before I ever got involved on this. So I had a, a really good perspective of all the things that I hated about credit card processing companies. Um, I have, you know, discovered that probably 80% of the people that are in the credit card processing industry, the companies that exist out there, especially the really large companies that make billions, they are really just thieves. They, they do, they train their sales reps to go in to tell you whatever it is that you want to hear. They flat out lie to you to get you to sign a contract that will end up putting you in a lease for a piece of equipment. And there's no guarantee what rates you're going to end up paying. And you're tied to that for two, three, sometimes up to four years with huge penalties if you try to get out of it. And that is the the epitome of how horrible this inter industry is there is no um there's no regulations as far as what they do and, and those big huge companies about every three and a half to four years they close and open up in another part of the state under another corporate name and just roll everything from one place to the other and just keep right on doing what they do. But they get such a huge bad name on the Internet that, you know, oh, oh I'm never going to work with these guys. But then this company is the same company, just doing it a different way. And that is the absolute worst part of it. Let me let me interrupt you for a second. Yeah. With an industry that is so pervasive and so lucrative and takes in so much money. How do they get away with not having strict oversight, at least through the banking industry? Or is it because they're sort of in between industries? How do they get away with it? Well, the processing part of it is very well controlled. OK, as far as your credit card, the security of the credit card, the, the fees and all the transactional stuff that takes place and your money going from there and back to you again, all that is very controlled because that is done through, you know, the, the, the federal entities that control banking and money and, and the banking uh, part of that side of it. It's getting, it's the sales part of you, the business owner, finding out who you want to work with and how you want to do your business. Okay. 20 years ago, there wasn't, you know, a whole lot of options and everybody pretty much did business the same way. And, but now uh, there's been so much evolution in the flow of business and how processing happens 
that there's so many things that are in there and nobody, nobody really controls that part of it. So smaller companies like us, Jada Pay, our whole basis has always been on customer service. What is right for the business owner? And when I went to work for them, you know, I came out of a business and that was the question I asked, can I do what's right for the business owner? Because if you're going to tell me I have to do these things, not interested, you know, and I was allowed to do that. And from that built, you know, a, a big clientele and people that are still with me today, you know, 15 years later, they still work with me, uh, which is, again, unheard of in the industry because most people switch as soon as they can because they can't stand what they're doing. Hmm. Uh, talk about transparency. I think that's part of the problem or maybe hidden fees. What, what is it around that that creates so much pain for people? Well, uh, probably the biggest problem is if there are leases that you don't even realize you're getting into because a piece of equipment that could cost 250 to let's say $500. Okay. Suddenly you're, you're stuck in a lease that you're paying anywhere from 30 to $50 a month and you can't get out of it. So you're paying, you know, 3000 to $6,000 for a piece of equipment that costs you 300 to $500. Okay. Those kind of hidden costs, you just don't realize because they don't tell you and suddenly you're just trapped the uh, contract fees. They say, okay, uh, you know, you're going to sign this. You're going to be with us for three years. There's a certain fee you have to pay every year to be in it. If you don't process with us, we're going to charge you a thousand dollars or whatever to try to get out of it. Uh, those two things are always very hidden and, and the ones that, that really kill business owners. The other part of it is the actual processing fees. I mean, they're over the years of being in this business, trying to understand processing fees is difficult. I mean, even, even today, I can look at some statements and go, Jesus, I have no idea what they're doing to you. <laughs> I know it's not right, but I can't figure out where they're, you know, what it is that they're doing. But there are, there are so many in parts and pieces to a processing fee. So, they may tell you, uh, oh, yeah, we're only going to charge you this. But they don't tell you then that there are all these automatic fees that come from the banks, the credit card that's, that holds the, the uh, charges, the processing entity that takes it, uh, the bank and the money back to you. There's all kinds of other fees. And so when it's all said and done, you go, my God, I thought I was supposed to get this at 1.82% and I'm paying four and a half. Why? Well, it's because all those other fees that they didn't tell you about because they didn't have to. OK, they just have to tell you what they are going to charge you. So that is probably one of the biggest things. And luckily, that has evolved tremendously over the last uh, four or five years with the onset of the cash discount program or the dual pricing program, which is what it's called today, which allows a business owner to actually pass the cost of the processing on to the person buying the goods, the person using that credit card. And now they don't have, you know, all of that extra cost. And that eliminates it, that, that, that problem completely. So that's a great thing. And that's the best thing that ever happened to the credit card industry and for retailers. If they'd have had it when I had my store, I sure as hell would have done it instantaneously because that was one of my biggest fears every month was how much is this bill going to be? How much are they going to take out of my checking account on the first? Because you never know what that amount's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> regarding the, the equipment, you know, for, for one thing, the equipment's getting simplified. Uh, it's easier in, in some situations, if you're invoicing, it's all done online. So there's not a point of sale uh, machine, but if there is, you know, you're a retailer, <clears throat> is there a right to purchase the equipment? Um, 
like by regulation, should they offer you the opportunity to purchase it rather than lease it? Or do they have to? Well, I, I have never leased a piece of equipment in my life. 99.9% uh, .9 of all of my clients, I have given them their piece of equipment at no cost. OK, the only exceptions to that rule was if they said, well, I need, you know, six or seven terminals to do all kinds of stuff. I said, well, here's what I'll do for you. And they would pay. But I would sell them to them. OK, at cost. OK, with no markup, uh, just because that's what they have to have in order to do their business. And if they're going to work with me, I want them to get the best deal they can. People who lease equipment, there is no offer to buy. OK, because the sales rep makes all his money from putting you in that lease. He doesn't get anything on the backside because he's not going to be with that company in six months anyway. Okay. He's going to burn all his bridges and be gone. So he's only there to put you in that lease and to sign you in that contract. But us is completely different. Okay. Now, if you're talking about point of sale systems where you need to track your inventory and do all that, those we sell, OK, I'm not going to, you know, give you one of those because you're going to have, you know, a thousand, you know, a couple thousand, three thousand, four thousand dollars, depending on what it is that you need. But that's an investment in your company that's going to help you do a job, track your inventory, give you better control over things. And all the processing is built right into that. So you would buy those. But then again, I don't lease them to you. I may set you up on a payment plan. If you say, hey, you know, I need six months to pay it, I'll say, sure, here's the cost. We'll divide it in six and you pay it. There's no interest or anything, you know, just to help you get the, you know, get the equipment that you need. And back to one other pain point of the contract. I'm sure that um, either people are signing the first three paragraphs of a contract on a tablet or they're being given a multi-page contract that there's no way for them to have the time to read. So there's a lack of transparency there. Can you comment? Oh, Set me straight. Yeah, the, the actual contract that every company has that contains all of the legal stuff just for the banking industry is 18 pages long. I've never even seen one, okay, because I'm not going to sit down and try to read 18 pages of legal. It's not going to happen. But uh, you're absolutely right. No one ever sees that. It's is all you're seeing is the little places that say you're responsible for this and you're responsible for that. And on those companies that put people in contracts, they don't even really tell them. They just say, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to set you up. We'll, we'll guarantee this for two years, three years or four years. Or, you know, we'll be your, your point of contact for for this. They don't even tell them. And it's not on there. In most places, it doesn't even say on the parts that they see that they're in a contract until they get the printed documentation that comes back. And there'll be a place on there as far as cancellation. If you look up cancellation, it says you are in this for this length of time and it costs you this much to get out. And that's how they got you. So <clears throat> let's let's switch the focus on you for a minute and Jada Pay. And some of the contrary practices that you employ um, that solve some of these pain points. Okay. Well, first of all, I've never put anybody in a contract ever. When we sign somebody up, it is month to month based on, you know, I'm going to do my job and you guys are in business. If you have to close your business down for some reason, you're, you know, you give us our equipment back if I gave it to you and you're done. Uh, if you decide that you want to change to a different processing company, you just have to let me know. Again, give me my equipment back if I gave it to you and you can go on your merry way. I'm not going to hold you to it because if you don't want to work with me, I don't necessarily want to work with you. <laughs> but, you know, it's <laughs> that is the number one thing, though is that uh -huh. we have I've never put anybody in any kind of a contract. So that's so important. And, and again, we don't do equipment leases. We don't force somebody to pay 
10, 20, 100 times more for a piece of equipment, we're going to either sell it to them at cost or we're going to give it to them, provide it for them to be able to do their business. Those okay. two things alone. Okay, let me yes. jump in. So one of the benefits of entering into a contract is having a, a set rate, although they may have a clause in that voluminous contract that says we can change our rates at any time. So what about that possible drawback of not having a locked in rate, you know, per transaction, uh, percentage, et cetera, by not having a contract? One of the little paragraphs that is in all those people who put you in a contract, it says your price is guaranteed for 90 days. After that, it could change due to all those things that you can't control, which includes them, okay? So you're only guaranteed 90 days, no matter what. And, okay. you know, with us, if I come in and let's say you're gonna do standard pricing, which is whatever the cost is, the interchange fees and all the things that the credit card companies and the banks charge, you're gonna have to pay that, whatever it is. And then I'm going to charge you, let's say, uh, you know, a half of a percentage point. Okay, on whatever it is that you charge. So you charge $100, you're going to owe me a half a percentage point is going to come to our company. And then you're going to pay whatever other costs are involved with that. All those other costs, nobody ever has any control over anyway, because every, every three to six months, Every bank reviews what they have. They can change processes and prices and things like that on, on those. But you're not talking about huge, massive amounts. They're fractions, okay, that are going to make a difference. But our part will never change for the length of the time that you are with me. If it's a half a percent, it's a half a percent from now till the day I die or you close your business. That doesn't change. Okay. And the, the really great thing about uh, doing the, uh, cash discount or the uh, dual pricing system is you're set up on a, on a on that flat fee of we'll just say four percent because it's an easy number four percent is going to get added to every transaction so if it's a hundred dollar charge it's going to be 104 at the end of the day you get your hundred dollars and the four dollars goes to pay all the bills so you have nothing out of pocket other than your, your 10 or 15 dollars a month for the uh, to have an account because you have to have you know your own account but beyond that you have no other cost okay keep going with your way of doing business as opposed to the industry in general okay so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have a conversation we're going to we're going to listen you're going to tell me what it is that you're doing, what it is you want to have, what kind of business that you operate. Um, and then, you know, we're not going to put you in a contract. We're going to generally furnish whatever piece of equipment that, that you may need, unless you need a point of sale system. And then we'll go down that path and talk about point of sales, depending on what that may be. Then we'll, we'll discuss and come to an agreement on how do you want your processing to take place? Do you want to pay the cost plus processing and you actually pay that out of your side of it? Or do you want to do the cash discounting and the dual pricing platform? So we have that discussion based on whatever that, you know, client decides that's where we go. And we put all that down. We, we have to, you know, of course, do an application, which is not a contract, but it's an application because you have to fill all that information out. We have to send you off to the processing entity. They have to do a risk assessment to make sure that the type of business you're doing, the volume of business you're doing, that they feel comfortable with that. Uh, of course, that would happen with every company that's out there. Once you pass the risk assessment and uh, they say, yes, we will open you account, you open the account, we get all the information to download into the equipment. Then we sit either, depending on where the location may be, we may just send the equipment to you and then set up a day for you to plug it in, go through the process and we talk through it. Or we have somebody come out, set it up, 
show you how to use it. You know, there are some variables in how that may work. And then you have a number, uh, a couple of different numbers to be able to call. So you've got 24 hours, seven days a week access to helplines uh, that can, you know, help you through any situations that may, may come up while uh, you're trying to process, which comes in really handy, you know, like on a Sunday morning when you show up and all of a sudden nothing's working. It's nice to know you got somebody to call uh, versus most of those other companies. If they even do, most of those companies send you to some other country, okay, of which 99% of the time you can't understand anything those people are saying, and they don't really even know what they're doing most of the time, okay? But it's a voice that you're, you're getting frustrated with because you're not getting resolution. So you know, we're, we're there to help all the way along the line from the day we start you up or even have that first conversation until we're done. Talk about your program, and I don't remember the term for it, where <clears throat> that you mentioned earlier, where you can charge the customer for all of the credit card fees, pass all of that, or I think most of that, um, <clears throat> to the to the purchaser. What's that called? Yeah. And so describe it. Yeah. All right. So originally when it came out, it was called a cash, cash discounting program. It's based on what gas stations have done for ever. OK, they've always had the right to do it. So whenever you're going down the road and you see those signs that flash on the highway, oh, the cash price is, you know, two dollars and fifty nine cents. The credit price is two dollars and eighty nine cents. OK, that's cash discounting. That's because there you use your credit card at the machine. You're paying the highest price. If you go in and give them 20 bucks, they're going to ring it in at the lower price. So that process has been going on at gas stations forever. But it was never allowed in the retail storefront operation until about I'm going to say five years ago. So I don't remember the exact date now, but it's been a, going on five years, maybe even a little longer. And. So that then opened up the door for the consumer to have that same choice. Okay, my you're going to buy a dollar bottle of water and it's going to cost you a dollar if you buy it with a dollar bill plus whatever sales tax are. We'll just assume sales tax everything. Okay, so you got a dollar, cost you a dollar. If you're going to use your credit card, though, you're going to pay an extra 4% for that to offset the cost that the processor is going to charge me for you using a credit card. The average, and, and you know, most people don't even think about this, that use credit cards all the time. They, they use their card for what reason? To get the points because they're going to take a trip or they're going to get cash back uh, or they're going to get free gifts. That's why they use their credit card. Everybody does it. They don't think about who pays for those points. It's not this credit card company. It's the store owner who pays those. All the fees that, that get collected, those go to pay those points. So I walk into a convenience store and I'm going to buy a dollar bottle of water. Okay. By the time he runs that credit card, he might as well have given it to me. Because he's going to pay more, okay, across the board than what that's worth. I mean, his whole goal is to get you to five bucks because at five dollars then the processing kind of breaks even and he still makes a profit. But somebody comes in there and they buy a, a 10 cent piece of candy and put it on a credit card. You might as well just give it to him, even with the cash discounting and, and all that. You're still not making any of your money back because you've got more in it than what, it, you know, what it's going to run. Mm. So that really helps them to to be able to cover all those costs on the average of what they're going to charge over a month, they're going to break even. They're going to collect enough money to pay all of the credit card fees so that at the end of the day, I make a little money off of it. And the store owner didn't cost him anything. 
And that's what makes that program just so beautiful and, and why it works so well. Today, it's now called the dual pricing platform. Uh, they wanted to change the name from cash discounting because that just sounded, ooh, like we're charging you to use your credit card. But what we're really doing now is we're just saying it's a dual price. So when you come in the door, you know that a bottle of water is a dollar four. And if you pay with cash, it's a dollar. So you've got two sets of prices and that opens, makes it so much simpler for everybody. When you make up your mind, you know, you're going to pay with a credit card or you're going to pay with a dollar bill. Are there other practices that you have employed um, that are not the standard practices within the industry that that we hate so much. <laughs> <laughs> what else are you well, doing differently? I, I, I think, I think really the number one thing is that I don't do, and we as a company don't do all of those underhanded things that this industry has such a bad name for, you know, and if you walk in, you walk into a, a location and say, yeah, I do credit card processing. The first thing they're going to do is they're going to try to run away. Okay. <laughs> they're going to give you a horrible look like, okay. And, and if you're really lucky, they don't pull out a gun and set it on the counter because they don't want to talk to you <laughs> because of all the times they have been burned and, and, and hurt. So it's, it's a, it's a process to get that first conversation. But once you break that ice and you're listening to what they have to say, then you can sympathize. And, you know, with me coming from the retail industry to begin with and owning my own store, I always start with that story. I said, yeah, I used to own a store. I understand because I had the same thing anytime somebody came in me or I got that nasty phone call. Oh, yeah, guess what? You need to do this, this, this. You know, hated it. So I think trying to avoid those things is, is the number one. Um, service, though, is another big key factor. Having somebody in place to be able to answer phones, to fix problems, to keep you running. Um, and if you something doesn't make your bank and you can't figure out where to track it down, then we can help you figure that out and say, oh, well, it's a holiday. OK, so it's not going to show up till tomorrow. Oh, OK. I didn't think about that. I mean, you know, but having somebody to at least tell you that, whereas you're worried that your, you know, five thousand dollar money that was coming in from the weekend is gone. No, it's just just sitting in electronic limbo until the banks are accepting money again. So answering those questions, I think, is probably one of the biggest things that that we go out of our way to do. Um, that other companies avoid like the plague. So <clears throat> you give your clients your phone number. And if I'm asking, and if they have a problem, you quarterback that problem for them. They, every client I have has my personal cell phone number. So they can, they can elect to call me first if they want to. OK. And a lot of times I get that call or I they've got my personal email and they send me an email and I'll it'll pop up and I'll go, hmm, OK, I don't know how to fix this, but call this number, which there's an 800 number that they can call that has that 24 hour service on it to be able to answer those questions and come up with solutions. I can get them to there or I can say, hang on, let me get one of my personal texts to take a look at this and see what I can come up with. And then a lot of times we can come up with an answer and half the time I already know the answer anyway, when they call, you know, it's something like, Oh, did you turn off the machine and reboot it? No, I didn't think about that. And they do that. It's like, Oh, Hey, it's working now. Thanks. And off they go. You know, I mean, a lot of times it is something like that, but for ones who've been with me for years, they always know those tricks. So if they, if they're calling me, they've got something they don't understand. And a lot of times I don't either. So I have to get them to a different source, but I'm always there. Got it. Let's, um, <clears throat> let's talk about the industry and some changes. I have never used Stripe, but I understand that 
it uh, is a more seamless, um, maybe maybe for uh, e-commerce. Um, what it, what is it if you if you know the particulars of it? But I think they were trying to evolve um, some of the pain uh, from some of the pain in making it easier to incorporate. Do you know anything about Stripe? I I know uh, a little bit about Stripe. I know that if you are a 100% e-commerce business, that uh, Stripe is probably one of the leaders in that division uh, because that's the kind of businesses that they, they go after. Whereas a regular credit card processing company like myself, that's not the number one business that we're after, but we do have some and we have really good alternatives for them to still be able to process. But um, they established themselves as, you know, one of the leaders because that's basically all they really deal with is that type of company. And, you know, you're using a point of sale system. It's all integrated into that to process directly through their platform. Um, they, they do have a tendency to charge a little more than other companies do. Part of that is because it, if they're exclusively doing uh, internet type sales, card not present stuff, there is more cost involved with that. Uh, but uh, it, it is a, it's a, you know, it's a good platform. I've, you know, I've got clients who eventually had to switch to Stripe because the equipment they bought, you know, it was designed to only work with that particular platform. And uh, the more sophisticated equipment gets, the more selective the processing platforms can be because those companies that are developing those systems decide they want to partner up with a particular platform for a reason, you know, that you probably would guess is because that way they make a piece of the action. Where if they say, oh, we're only going to let you use Stripe and Stripe is going to automatically build in, you know, a quarter of a percentage point that gets kicked back to this manufacturer. That's a cost you're going to be paying and it goes to them and you don't have a choice. You know, uh, it's kind of a monopoly in a way, uh, but it'll never get changed because the more sophisticated equipment gets and the more money that these companies put into technology um, and development, the more they want to make back on the other end. So yeah. it's just kind of the nature of the beast. They're not all like that, but you see it more and more, uh, especially uh really specialized designed uh, point of sale systems for like uh, the clothing industry. Uh, some of the food industries are, are like that, although there are a lot of really good independent uh, point of sale systems. We just got back from a training last week down in Orlando with one that's based out of there that's been around for a lot of years. And they've got a great program that you can use any processing you want with them. So, you know, and they, they do a great job. Um, <clears throat> what about PayPal? What what place do they have in uh, in this? What did what do they bring to the table? PayPal, if PayPal has its place for somebody who either doesn't do enough business to really warrant having a credit card machine or a point of sale system, kind of like Square, okay, the same kind of process. You're just getting started. You have no idea what you're going to be doing. You can, you know, get invested in that for nothing and, and you know what you're going to pay. The difficulties, and we'll just talk about PayPal because that's what you asked. PayPal, their policy, though, is that the customer – is going to get their money back for any reason at all. So I use PayPal to collect my money and I sold this guy something and he got his something and he, he opened it up and he goes, yeah, it's not quite as pretty as what I'd like. So he calls PayPal and gets on there and says, no, nah, this, this wasn't nearly as good as what I thought. Uh, or 
he'll just flat out lie to him and say, I never got it. Okay. Whatever it is he says, PayPal is going to automatically take that money back away from you and you can't do anything about it. You can't win the battle. You can't fight the battle. You can't prove anything. And it happens more and more all the time with things on PayPal. So that is something you just can't control. Now, if you're using a regular system and someone uses a card and then they try to contact their bank and do a chargeback, which was the same thing that they do with PayPal, you may still get have to go through the process because they're going to take their money and they're going to charge you a fee for that chargeback because that's just because there's a cost involved. But you'll have the opportunity to put your case out there. And if you've done everything you're supposed to do, then you will win that case 90% of the time. With PayPal, you're never going to win it. So that's uh, the downside. The last one I want to ask you about is all speculative at this point, but Elon, uh, who was one of the founders of PayPal, wants to turn X into the everything app and accept payments. Do we have any inkling of what he's thinking and, and what they're planning to do? Did, has any of that leaked out into the industry? I have absolutely no idea. I have, I have not heard about that, but the evolution of uh, the credit card processing equipment has come so far in the last three years. I mean, it has just exploded um, that eventually I think that there will be other forms of being able to get paid. Cryptocurrency is one of those things that I know has come up in some of our conversations that um, certain processing platforms are considering the opportunity of putting that on a credit card machine to where they could pay with cryptocurrency. Uh, but the government doesn't really want that because they have no control over cryptocurrency. And that's a difficult thing to get by. And you would have no protection if you did that and the cryptocurrency that you got today, suddenly the bottom falls out. That hundred dollars is worth 10 cents. Well, guess what? It's only worth 10 cents. You know, you can't do anything about it. So I think there's going to be a lot of um, slow uh, movement towards these different types of currency payments that are being considered uh, from a retail standpoint. The, the people who do business online and sell electronic, you know, uh, device, you know, not electronic devices, but uh, things that you just get, you know, a file, those people, it won't matter. They'll, they'll use cryptocurrency because if it's worth a dollar, they made a dollar. If it's worth a dime, they made a dime. And they got nothing in it anyway, you know, after the initial development. So it'd be okay. You know, we've also got these other <coughs> payment, payment systems, uh, Zelle through the banking system, Venmo, which I think is similar to PayPal. Yeah. I haven't explored it. So we've got we've got these other payment systems uh, that I think are mainly used for <clears throat> like selling stuff on eBay and uh, uh, Facebook Marketplace and that sort of thing. Those are designed for person to person. So if you want to sell me something, you can say, hey, can you Venmo me the money? Well, I'll log into my account. It comes directly out of my checking account. It gets deposited in your checking account. And that's great for me to you. A business can't do that, though, okay, because they would have to open up their Venmo account every time somebody walked in the door because it's not like they can swipe a card or that they can do anything quick, fast, and easy. So it just doesn't work on that type of platform. And I don't see that ever becoming the norm again for, for retail stores and, and, and uh, the regular marketplace. But for individuals, I mean, my wife and I, we Venmoed money back and forth to, you know, uh, the kids and grandkids and stuff like that for, you know, different things. I don't keep the account open because I don't trust, 
I don't trust it. So as soon as, as soon as we make it and the transaction's cleared, everybody's got it, close it down. So I don't want anybody else to get into it because if they have access to my checking account, they can steal everything. That's yeah. why I don't use debit cards either because of the same reason. The number one theft on, on, uh, in the, in the uh, fraud industry uh, is uh, debit cards at gas stations. And so if you're using a chip card now, Okay, you're a lot safer because of the way it's all encrypted. But if you're not using a chip card and or you're using a pen debit card at the gas pump and that information gets stolen, they have your pin number, which means in a couple of weeks when they decide to gather their information and they process it and you wake up one morning and your twenty thousand dollars that used to be in your checking account is gone. You can't get it back and there's no win and there's no battle because they took it with your pin number and it's just gone. So never the first piece of advice I always tell everybody is never buy gas with a pin debit card. Always process it as a credit card because then you're safe. The credit card company would be held responsible for this deal. Okay. Well, this is, this has been really informative and I, appreciate and and i'm assuming our listeners are going to as well um the differentiation between how you do business and how the majority of the industry does business and i think that with personal service with <clears throat> lack of contracts with lack of s- leasing equipment that uh, I think you're really showing showing the value, you know, that you can provide. Um, <clears throat> can will you share your contact information? And can you service anybody anywhere in the United States, Canada? What what is your geographic limit? Uh, at the present time, anywhere in the United States. Okay, okay which also includes uh, California, or not Cal, but. Uh, uh, Alaska, uh, you know, we, we can do that. We are actually working on being able to go into Canada and do processing, but that yet quite hasn't developed. But any place in the United States, continental United States, is we're, we are good to go. Um, and, uh, you know, those can be handled, uh, you know, by me through our company. And, and uh, you know, we would love to be able to, to talk with you and look at whatever, you uh, needs you may have, whether it's a small machine or you need, you know, point of sale systems to run a, a restaurant or a, you know, a huge store or something. You know, we, we do have the ability to do that. And to, to get a hold of me, uh, you know, I'm Chris Mattingly. So you can call me on my cell phone, which is 812-267-4610. You can send me an email at Chris, that's C-H-R-I-S, at J to pay, J A D A P A Y dot com. Uh, that's the two easiest ways to reach me. I think uh, other information as far as my calendar link and stuff like that will be available to where you can, um, you know, always set up a 30 minute Zoom call and we can have a conversation from wherever you are. So, well, and we will put that down in the show notes down below. Okay. Uh, Great. Wonderful. So, and uh, you know what? If you can, let's be sure. Uh, to get your calendar link uh, to our editors uh, who edit this podcast. Okay. All right. Um, Chris, thank you so much. It was really informative. I appreciate your openness. I also appreciate your willingness uh, and to, to discuss other options um, like the uh, square and, and distinguishing between those. Um, and just your your transparency uh, and the way you're doing business. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining in. Uh, just one example of a our almost weekly podcast where we focus on a different type of business um, and different different businesses. And they're all fascinating to be able to do a deep dive for an hour. Uh, I think is a real luxury. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, If you like the episode, 
uh, please click the like button, subscribe, click that notification bell so you'll be notified of other ones. And uh, we're outmarket.pro, a digital marketing agency uh, that's very client focused as well. So check us out on the web. And Chris, thanks again for joining us. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you very much. And one thing I didn't mention, Mark, was that I am trying to hire sales reps anywhere in the United States. So if you have an interest in this business or would like to know more about it and become a sales rep, please reach out to me and let's have a conversation. So thanks again, Mark. Yeah, great. And thanks. Thanks for adding that.